Great, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today we are going to be talking about the consequences of tax immigration. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Erin Sneeman, and I have been in the accounting and tax industry for over 12 years now, with a specific focus on international tax matters. Before we begin today, just three points to note is the first is all the slides that are going to be presented today will be made available to all of you after the session. Secondly, tax is a really complex element. So while today I'm going to give you a lot of general information and overview, each case may have different legislation that could be applied. So it's just to bear that in mind. And then lastly, we're going to do a question and answer session at the end. So if you do have any questions during the um, webinar, just put them in the Q&A chat box um, at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of the session, we will then go through those um, questions. So today, the topics that we are going to be covering are firstly, do I need to financially immigrate and what that means? We're then going to be looking at South African residency, so determining your residency and looking at the double taxation agreements, breaking your residency, so the timing of that, how do you notify SARS and when a deemed disposal is triggered. We're going to then briefly look at the pressure that SARS is putting on expats, some withholding tax issues, and then lastly, we're going to be looking at retirement funding. So diving straight into it, Looking at financial immigration, I think most of you would know that the financial immigration process changed in March 2021. There was lots of um, noise about this on social media, and that's when a lot of people realized there might be something that they needed to have done. Now, this formal financial immigration process is a reserve bank process where you change the status with the reserve bank um, of you to be non-resident. Now, Financial immigration is not always necessary. It depends on how much money you're wanting to offshore. But even without having to financially immigrate, you can still make use of the foreign investment allowance, which is 10 million rand per calendar year, as well as the single discretionary allowance, which is 1 million rand per calendar year. There are some regulations and guidelines around the offshoring of those funds, so those would also need to be considered. And whilst financially immigrating is not always necessary, if your residency from a tax perspective does cease, then SARS does need to be informed. So looking at South Africa and the um, residency tests in South Africa, the first test to determine your residency in South Africa is a subjective test. And this is what we term ordinarily resident. Now, it's not defined in South African leg legislation, but there's a lot of case law around it. And ultimately, what SARS is trying to identify is, will you return to South Africa after your wanderings? And so there's no time frame. You might go to Australia for three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, and then return to South Africa. If SARS believes that the time that you left South Africa that your intention was to return, whether that's 5, 10, 15 years, then they will deem you to be South African tax resident. Now, there's lots of different factors to, um, to be considered when you're assessing your ordinarily resident status. So some of the items that would need to be assessed would be, what is your intention? And that intention is, what is your intention when you left South Africa originally? So the date that you got on the plane, what was your intention then? So I will also look at your mo most fixed place of settlement. They will look at where you are habitually abode. So ultimately, where are you spending majority of your time? They will look at where your personal interests are, where your place of business is, where your employment is, other economic factors. Do you still have investments or are you earning funds in South Africa? That's going to play a big part in this ordinarily residence test. Where are your belongings? Do you hold South African nationality? Do you hold other country nationalities? Where are your family? What sort of social ties do you have back in South Africa? SARS will also um, look into your cultural and other activities. And then they're going to look at your periods if you've spent abroad, 
where you spent abroad, the purpose of those periods abroad, and what was the nature of those periods abroad. So I will also then look at your frequency of visits back to South Africa and the reason why you came back to South Africa. So if your intention is to immigrate and you do want to come back to South Africa, if you're coming back for a holiday, that's all right. But what SARS want, doesn't, want, doesn't want is that you're coming back to South Africa because you've got business or investments and you're running companies over South Africa. It's going to start looking like you're ordinarily resident in South Africa and that your ties to South Africa have not broken. So we're now going to look at physical presence. So if at any period during that tax year, you have um, indicated that you're not ordinarily resident, so you have assessed all of those factors and you have identified that based on those factors, your ordinary residence has ceased because you're now immigrating, you've got no intention to return to South Africa, you've assessed your ties, you're now no longer ordinary residents based on those subjective tests that you've applied. What needs to happen then is you need to follow the physical presence test to determine if you are South African tax resident by virtue of being physically present in South Africa. Now, the ordinarily residence test is a subjective test. So the onus is upon the taxpayer to prove to SARS that you ceased your residence via ordinarily residence test. The physical presence test is a black and white test. It's about the number of days. So you either meet the requirements or you don't. So the first um, step in order, in order to meet this test is, were you in South Africa for more than 91 days during the tax year that you are assessing? Were you also in South Africa for, 91, for more than 91 days in the previous five tax years of assessment? And then looking back for those five years of assessment, were you in total in those previous five years in South Africa for more than 915 days? Now for this test, you've got to tick box one, box two, and box three for you to then be physically present. Okay, the day that you leave South Africa is really important because that could trigger some tax consequences as well. So it needs to be important and planning around when you're leaving, if you haven't already left, is also quite important as well. Now a person who is resident in South Africa because you're meeting the days test, you would effectively cease your residency when you have been out of South Africa for more than 330 days. If you then meet that 330 day test, then your residency, the cessation of that will then be backdated to the actual date that you left South Africa. We're gonna go through a worked example here just so you can have an idea of how it would work. So just checking that um, you can see my slide now, we're on a new slide. Yes, 100%, we can see it. Perfect, thank you. All right, so this example, I'm going to just um, outlay the scenario and then we're going to go have a look at this and um, the number of days. So Sarah is a citizen of Australia. She's working for a South African company and she never visited South Africa to her first date of entry where we see top row there, 29th of June, 2011. Okay. Now, Sarah was physically present in South Africa for the following periods. When we talk about year of assessment, we're looking at the year from March to February. So just bear that in mind when we um, refer to year of assessment. So Sarah was physically present in South Africa in the 2017 year of assessment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work backwards from the 2017 tax year of assessment, and then I'm going to look backwards for the previous five years to see if she's meeting the physical presence test, and then we're going to see if she ceased her residency in South Africa. So looking at 2017 year of assessment, we can see that she was in South Africa for a period of more than 91 days. We've got that 17 days and the 94 days, um, second and third from the bottom over there. So she ticks box one as being in South Africa for more than 91 days. She was physically present for more than 91 days in each of the five prior years. If we look at the first line there, 2012, we can see she was in SA for 246 days. In 2013, she was in South Africa for 91, 92 days. In 2014, she was in South Africa for 181 days. In 2015, we're going to add those two figures together because that's for the year of assessment. So we've got the 82 and 113 days. So that is 195 days. So she's ticking the box there. 
and in 2016 she was in South Africa for 244 days. Right, so we've assessed um, point two and we meet that point. Now what we need to do is ensure that she's meeting the 915 day aggregate test for the previous five years and if we add all of those figures together we get 958 days so we tick that box. So because she's now met all the requirements in terms of the physical presence test what happens is for the 2017 year of assessment she would effectively phys be physically present and tax residents in South Africa from the year of assessment beginning 2017 so that would be 1st of March 2016 and that's irrespective that she was not in South Africa on the 1st of March 2016. All right. Now what we see is Sarah is absent from South Africa so we see the last date um, is 30th of November 2016 so she's absent from the um, South Africa from the 1st of December 2016 right up until the 31st of October 2017. She then comes back for a brief period of 30 days. Now what we need to determine is for that break that she was out of South Africa, was she out of South Africa for more than 330 days? And yes, the total number for that period is 335 days, so she's meeting the 338 day rule and she effectively ceases to be South African tax resident from her original departure date being 30th of November 2016. And that's when she would no longer be South African tax resident. Now, breaking your tax residency. So bearing in mind, when we look at the days test, it must be noted that if you're going to leave South Africa, but then you're going to be tax resident by virtue of the days test, then it's very important that if you're going to return to South Africa in the following year of assessment, that you're not in South Africa for more than 91 days, because in that instance, you're then going to be ticking box one, ticking box two, and ticking box three, in which case your residency won't be broken. So looking at an example of this, let's say you leave South Africa. So last year, December, you leave South Africa, you deem to be South African tax resident in 2023, because you have now been in South Africa for the relevant number of days, and you want to return to South Africa for a holiday in 2024. So bear in mind, to break your residency, you mustn't be in South Africa for that 2024 tax year for more than 91 days. Now, if you are, then you're obviously going to meet point one of the physical presence test, you're going to meet point two, and you're going to meet point three potentially, and so your residency is not broken, which means that you're going to need to apply the days test each for each year of assessment if you plan to come back to South Africa to determine where your tax residency lies. Now, if you are deemed to be a South African tax resident, so let's say you're deemed to be a South African tax resident because you've assessed um, the factors and you, and you now are South African tax resident by virtue of the laws, and you are a UK tax resident, so let's say you've been in the UK for more than 183 days, so you're meeting the UK tax residency laws, what's happening here is both jurisdictions are grabbing you under their individual tax laws. Now what happens in that instance is effectively you are tax resident in both countries, but a double taxation agreement exists, and that's when we need to forego the individual tax laws and follow the double taxation agreement to determine your tax residency status. I have um, indicated where you can find the double taxation agreements on the SARS website, so you can always um, navigate back to this page if you're wanting to see the full um, double taxation agreements, as well as which agreements exist between South Africa and other countries. So each double taxation agreement has a paragraph like this, where it assesses your tax residency. So again, this is a subjective test, so the onus is upon the taxpayer. But ultimately, what needs to happen is you're, if you are grabbed by both jurisdictions and for tax residency purposes, we're going to go and work our way through here. So for the first point, effectively, what um, SARS is wanting to determine here is where was your permanent home available? Now, if you've got a permanent home in South Africa and you've got a permanent home in the UK, even if you're renting, if you've got a home available in the UK to, your, to the individual as well in South Africa, then ultimately we can't determine and where your residency lies and we need to move to point B. Now, if you only have a permanent home available in one of those jurisdictions, 
then your tax residency would point to that um, to that country. So if we say you've got a permanent home in both, we then move to point B. Now, point B is where are you habitually abode? Now, if you are habitually abode in both jurisdictions, so ultimately you're spending an equal amount of times in both of the countries, then we would need to move to point C. But if you can identify that you're spending majority of your time in, let's say, the UK, then your tax residency would point to the UK. Point C, if you can't determine via point B, you'd move to point C, and it would be where are you, um, where are you a national? Now, if again it's pointing to both, we'd have to move to point D, but if you can determine that, then that's where your residency status would lie. I've never in all my time ever had to get to point D, but if you do get to point D, ultimately the, both of the authorities, so both SARS and HMRC in the UK, would need to come in and be involved, and they would then settle the question by mutual agreement as to where your tax residency would lie. If you've previously been in one of these um, ceasing um, your tax residency in South Africa and the consequences of immigration webinars, you would have noted, um, noticed we previously spoke about this slide. I'm not going to speak about it, but I wanted to just make it um, known that this is no longer available, the way to break a residency like this with SARS. It's not available to taxpayers anymore. SARS website indicates that it's still a, a route that can be done, but it's not. So don't do it this way. There's no confirmation um, from SARS in terms of this way either. Um, so, so just avoid this. So once your residency has broken, so now you've assessed everything in terms of the days test or nearly residence test, you've assessed the other country, you've now come to the conclusion that you've got your date where your residency ceases, you would need to now notify SARS. Now there is a form um, on SARS's website um, and that is a declaration form that indicates that you're going to cease to be a tax resident um, in South Africa. You would then be able to submit this form to SARS and they would want a lot of supporting evidence and documentation to confirm that your residency status has ceased in South Africa. Just a note on this, on, on this form as well, one of the big factors that SARS wants is to have um, a certificate of tax residency in the other country. So without that certificate or without a form indicating you've got residency from a tax perspective in the other country, SARS is not going to um, issue you with your formal letter indicating that you have now broken your residency. So just bear that in mind as well. On the day that you cease to be South African tax residency, you are deemed to have disposed of your worldwide assets, and this is called the Section 9H charge. So what effectively happens at this point is you need to make note of all of your assets that you have um, in South Africa, as well as everywhere else in the world, and you need to assess whether those assets are going to fall within the Section 9H charge. So effectively what this means is that all your property and all your assets are going to be deemed to have been disposed on the day before you cease to be tax resident and you reacquire those assets on the day that you, be, you cease um, your residency in South Africa. Now, you reacquire those assets at the same proceeds as your deemed disposal and that becomes the new base cost and you effectively reacquire all of those assets in the new currency of your um, country that you have now immigrated to. Excluded in this deemed disposal is your South African immovable property. Okay, now there's no def like de definitive answer around the day of when you cease to be resident and what this day looks like from a section 9H charge, but there is some guidance to indicate that it would be the day that you step onto the plane. But the Sorry, everything okay? Okay, I'm just going to continue. On. So there is no evidence, um, there is no um, de definitive guidance around that, and um, because there is no um, case law around it, because it is all quite new, but so it is a subjective test as well. And then again, the year of assessment will be very important in terms of when you deem to have um, disposed of your worldwide assets because immediately, um, effectively, from a provisional tax like this, no, this TD gave you this. This is our clients. I know. So, it's needed. 
I'm just going to let him mute. Well, I don't know. Not on mute. Um, just, one, just one moment. Sorry, everyone. I just want to let um, Candice um, not on mute. Okay, so sorry everyone about that. I hope um it's not too disruptive. So we've just got much on. So in terms of the year of assessment, that's going to be deemed to have ended um, immediately prior to the station and then to start the next day. Which is very important from a provisional tax perspective. If you are a provisional taxpayer, um, I'm going to show you again another work example. But effectively, the year of assessment ends, and that's when your provisional, your second provisional tax payment is effectively due with SARS. Now, if you've got a section 9H charge, then obviously that's when the provisional tax on that charge would need to be paid across to SARS. And a lot of the time, you, you're potentially ceasing your residency on the day. Um, you know, the day before you, you get onto the plane, in this case, what's happening is you're sitting with a potential cash flow issue of seeming to have disposed of these worldwide right assets. So if they, and, and this is an important consideration because there's going to be interest that is going to be issued by SARS on late and underpayments. So again, we're going to do another worked example just so we can um, how this looks in, in real life aspect. So if we look at this example, John is immigrating to the UK. He leaves South Africa on the 28th of March 2020, and he has a job starting in the United Kingdom on the 1st of May 2020. Now he owns a UK rent property, and he's also got a primary residence in South Africa. Now, his primary residence in South Africa has been on the market for four months. Now, he's got no intention to ever return to South Africa. What he has done is he has gone through the steps to determine his ordinarily resident status, and he's very confident he doesn't meet the ordinarily residence test. Okay, from a UK perspective, we're just going to ignore the double taxation agreement in this example, and we're just going to work through it from a South African perspective at this point. So, First off, John doesn't meet the ordinarily residence test, so he has to move to step two, which was the physical presence test. Now, he leaves on the 28th of March, so we know that the start of the tax year would be 1st of March, so he's only in South Africa for 28 days, in which case he doesn't meet that 91-day rule, in which case we say, okay, you haven't met the first point, physical re um, presence is broken then, okay? So his residency is potentially broken, on the 28th of March, and I put that in red and bold there because we still need to meet the 330 day rule. Okay, now let's assume John meets this rule. So John is deemed to have disposed of his worldwide assets on the 27th of March, and then he reacquires those assets on the 28th of March. Now, his South African property is immovable, and so we exclude that in our consideration for the section 9H charge. But what will fall within the ambit of that section 9H charge is the UK property. Now, that UK property would need to have been deemed to have been disposed of, and any capital gains tax on that will need to be paid across to SARS. Now, what I've done here at the bottom is I've shown you the full timeline, obviously, of the tax year for the year of assessment being 1st of March 2020, all the way to the end of Feb 2021. However, looking at John's example over here, he's only he's leaving on the 28th of March, so we've got a short year of assessment. Now, your deemed disposal is triggered on the 28th of March, and your second provisional tax payment for your deemed disposal is effectively due on your last day um, on the last day of your year of assessment. In this case, being 28th of March 2020. So you can see what sort of cash flow implications this would have, and you can also see what issues this would create from an interest um, and penalty perspective from SARS if you haven't assessed everything prior to leaving South Africa. So just going through um, our final few points here uh, around the pressure on expats. So SARS is of the opinion that a lot of expats are likely to be non-compliant and the non-compliance reasons would be, and, and this is not exhaustive, there is a comprehensive list, but some of the important factors are if you haven't ceased your tax residency in South Africa, if you haven't filed tax returns in South Africa, and if you haven't declared your foreign income, because that is required um, by a South African taxpayer. Now, 
There's, and this is not to scaremonger anyone, but obviously it needs to be known that there, that there is a lot of this um, happening with SARS and, and there are units, you know, applying pressure on expats, but th there's a lot of punishment that come if you don't engage and comply properly with SARS's queries and directives around this. So the punishment for non-compliance would be in the following areas. Um, so non-cooperation, no non non sorry, with SARS official. So if you don't submit, um, if you don't submit complete and correct documents, if you neglect to notify SARS of the change of your personal details, and if you don't retain records as required under the Tax Act. So whilst this is not a complete list, obviously SARS is willing to go to the prosecution route to punish taxpayers, um, and it can lead to fine and imprisonment. Now, just because you're solely abroad and you're not ever coming to South Africa, and I think a lot of the times, and to give you a real life example, we have had people who have left South Africa in like 2000, so that's 23 years ago, and they've put their head in the sand and they've said, well, SARS doesn't need to know because I've never come back to South Africa. What you don't want to happen, and we go back to that section 9H charge, what we don't want to happen is for you um, as a taxpayer to say, I've been abroad for 23 years. I'm not actually going to cease my residency formally like I'm meant to because I'm never going back to South Africa. What's the point? And that has happened. What happens in that instance is think of all the assets that you're acquiring now in these 23 years in your new country. SARS, if you don't notify them, has every reason to believe that you are a South African tax resident. And they will, at that point, want you to declare your foreign income and tax you in South Africa on that foreign income. Another consideration is if you then at 23 years later decide I'm going to cease my residency, you've got a, there's a lot of ground for SARS to say, well, provide me all of this information that your actual intention in 2000 was to immigrate abroad. Um, you know, and at that point, they could say, well, we believe that your residency only ceased from this date. And the onus then is you and SARS against each other. And it, it just becomes a bit of a nightmare. And you don't want all of those worldwide assets that you've now acquired to fall within the Section 9H charge. So the onus remains with the taxpayer to declare and formalize their tax residency with SARS. Um, you don't want to find yourself in a, in a, in a situation where you've got a non-compliant profile. From a withholding tax perspective, so withholding tax is a final tax and that's levied on non-residents. So if you do have investments offshore or abroad, you would sometimes see that your dividends has got a withholding tax element to it and that is tax that's been withheld and is a final tax. Now each source of income, so each you know dividend, interest, royalties, those all have different withholding tax rates. So for example, dividends in South Africa are subject to 20% withholding tax. So that net dividend is then paid out to the non-resident shareholder, and that would be the final tax levied on that dividend. Now, if you were to read the double taxation agreement, that would stipulate the percentage on which to withhold the tax. It might be less than 20%. So for an example, if you were to have a look at the double taxation agreement and you navigate, navigate down to the dividend section, that might say, okay, this country withholds tax at a 10% and that's the maximum that you're allowed to withhold tax at. Now, if you are earning dividends as a non-resident, you can apply to SARS. All the forms are found um, on the SARS website. So you can find those forms and you can get that verify that percentage, percentage verified by SARS and you then provide that um, form from SARS to the third party who's issuing out the dividend and they will then withhold the tax at 10%. Now the saving of that, the 10% saving, is what we call double taxation relief. That's just one example. There are multiple different sources of income that withholding tax is levied on um, and each double taxation agreement, depending on the country you're in, will indicate a different rate. So Retirement funds on immigration, so this is quite a big thing. We are now starting to get, um, with the new rules, we are um, approaching that three-year um, rule. So whilst we don't have a lot of case law, it's starting to come up now. So previously, um, if you were before retirement age, you could um, complete the formal process of fi um, financial immigration. Remember, we spoke about that being a reserve bank process for exchange control purposes. Um, and then you could withdraw your time and savings and offshore that. Now, it used to be beneficial for expats because you would obviously could take those funds across and you could then start your life abroad with all of those um, funds from your retirement. Now, 
I've put, um, I've kept these slides on whilst these are the old rules. I've kept these slides on because I wanted to bring your attention to if you are, um, if you do have retirement funding and, and you're thinking of um, withdrawing that, if you're coming, approaching the three year, we'll chat about that now. If you are approaching that, then um, just to consider if you're under retirement age, you are going to be taxed according to the early retirement withdrawal benefit tax tables, which means that only the first 27,500 is going to be tax free. If you were to wait and pull these um, retirement funds at retirement age, you will see the benefit um, here. You're going to be taxed at different tax tables. Your first 550,000 would be tax free. So there's lots to weigh up here, lots, to, lots of pros, lots of cons, lots to think about in terms of um, the return on your investment in South Africa versus offshoring that um, in the new country and seeing what sort of return you can get over there. So previously, if you were then at retirement age, you could with, obviously could withdraw that one third of the total fund. And if you had followed the process of the Reserve Bank, um, then you could um, offshore the remaining two thirds um, that could be um, accessed. Obviously, you'd pay the tax and then you could move it to the new country immediately. Now, the new rules with regards to retirement funding. So the rules have changed. Effectively, the lump sum is only going to be paid out after three years. And you would need to um, ensure that you have indicated to SARS um, that you have non-tax residency status for three years. It must be continuous three years. And the onus is, of course, on the taxpayer. If you're already sitting in the country, in your new country, and you immigrate, and your intention was to immigrate more than three years ago, it can be backdated, obviously, to the date that your actual um, non residency status began. So, this impacts preservation and retirement annuity funds. And one of the major um, points here is that SARS needs to be satisfied that a genuine exit has been made. So obviously, it's important that you assess all of the ordinarily um, residents and the physical presence tests. So again, like I said, obviously, if you early, um, if you withdraw those funds early, then you're subject to a much higher tax rate um, than what you would have been if you made the um, withdrawal after retirement age. So those who have um, retirement annuities are going to be the most inconvenienced. Members of um, RAs will have to wait the full three-year period, whilst um, pension and provident preservation funds might be able to access some certain pre-retirement benefits um, once prior to retirement. And then pension and provident funds is a bit of an easier access to funds, um, for example, if you've got a lump sum upon the termination of your employment. I think the main thing to consider here is if you need those funds, um, you know, what, what it would look like from a tax perspective in South Africa and, and the potential of what those funds would be used for and just assess and weigh up if that is the benefit. What we're going to do now is we are going to move on to some questions. So if there have been questions, I'll have a look at the Q&A um, um, question box now and we'll go through those. If you've got any um personal or specific scenario questions, um, then you're more than welcome to email me. I've put my email here for you to have a look at. Um, so that's erin at salesolutions.co.uk and I can help with those um, questions. Um, I think for now in the question box, let's limit it to just general questions around the webinar rather than um, case specific um, as there would be a lot more information I would need to advise um, on that. Just going to have a look quickly. Let's, okay. Okay. So let's start with um, Lynette over here. I have a client in Scotland, residency tests passed. He has investments in SA, interest is accrued. He declares it there. He never notifies SARS except he has a tax clearance route to follow. All right. So in this case, um, yeah, if SARS, um, if his cessation of residency hasn't formally been done through SARS, then SARS would have every right to believe that he is South African tax resident, um, even if he has assessed the residency test himself. So it's important that he does the whole cessation of residency with SARS and gets a formal confirmation that his residency has ceased, because um, in short over here, if he, if he doesn't do that process, SARS believes he's a South African tax resident for tax purposes and would want to then 
you know, from a tax residency perspective, declares worldwide income in South Africa. So BST does that, and um, if you follow the correct process, SARS will then issue um, issue your client with a letter to formally state that a South African tax residency has ceased, and it will indicate a date as well. Okay. If you never worked in South Africa, so you never got a tax reference number and left for the UK straight after university, now a few years later, are you still responsible for outstanding tax returns? Um, yes, um, Gail. In, in terms of in terms of this, yeah, effectively, ultimately, from that perspective, without a tax, um, yeah, without without a tax number it does make it a tougher situation, but ultimately it still comes back to that test from an ordinary residence perspective to determine, you know, would SARS deem them to have, you know, come back to South Africa at some point. Um, and so it's still advised that um, a formal cessation of residency is done, even without the tax number, you can, SARS can issue um, a tax number, even, you know, from a today's perspective, let's say from today, and, and you see the residency on that tax number. So SARS knows that the residency has ceased. Again, without them having knowledge of that and with that um, client being a South African um, citizen, SARS would believe that they're South African tax resident from that perspective. So again, based mm -hmm. that they cease their tax residency for me with SARS. Um, Jacques, um, how is living, living annuity treated? Um, I will have to get back to you on the living, living annuity perspective there. It would, yeah, I need some more information around that. So pop me a mail at erin at salesolutions.co.uk um, and then we can um, chat around the living annuity and how that would be um, taxed and treated abroad and in South Africa as well. Vicky, on your last side, it mentioned that ceasing tax residency comes with a deemed capital day. Is this only where assets no. So, Vicky, in terms of the um, capital gains, it's a deemed disposal. So, even if you don't actually sell those assets, if you if you ceased residency, um, and let's say you've still got these assets and you have no intention of selling these assets at that date of exit, you're still deemed to have sold those assets and taxes paid on those assets which haven't been sold. And that's where the cash flow implication comes from. Um, and, and you deem to have disposed of them, and then you reacquire them the date your residency ceases in the new country's um, currency, and you reacquire them at that proceeds value. So effectively, the growth then is taxed in the new country. Um, there are, of course, um, some assets which are outside of the Section 9H charge, but um, yeah, I'm happy to chat with you and um, privately around um, the situation and to assess those assets as well. Helena, if kids worked um, doing odd jobs while studying and we reached through the SARS and have now moved to the UK and have been there over five years, do they have to go through the same process to add they've never completed a tax return? Definitely. Yeah, definitely they would need to go through the process. Um, specifically in this case where they are registered with SARS and um, even doing the odd jobs, yeah, SARS would still, if they haven't been notified, SARS would believe that these um, these kids are South African tax resident and so they would need to seize their taxation um, residency with SARS. If they've been in the UK for over five years and if the intention back then was to immigrate and not ever return to South Africa and, and the whole process is followed correctly in terms of assessing your residency, it can be backdated to the five years, um, to the five years when they actually left. And um, then Gail, can you backdate the date, date of application if you never did the official? Yes, yeah, definitely. So I think I gave an example of um, we once had a, a client who left in 2000 and for 23 years hadn't done anything. And um, that residency was, the cessation of their residency was backdated to 2000. Again, it comes down to your intention and it comes down to assessing um, all of the criteria. Again, SARS, when you break your residency, it's not, it, whilst it is just a form, there is a lot that SARS asks for. And one of those, um, um, one of the things they do ask for is a motivation letter. 
um, we do do a we can do a whole report which um, outlines the full residency in both the jurisdictions and um, to to give a bit more guidance um, you know to SARS that the taxpayer has actually assessed things and they have sought um, advice around it and and given them specific legislation of how that person broke broke their tax residency and they will then backdate it provided obviously they're happy with um, all of the supporting documentation. All right, just um, all right. Um, yes, sorry about all the background noise. Um, yeah, apologies about that. If there is anything that um been unclear um during the whole webinar, or if there's anything you feel that you've missed, pop me a mail um, and we can go through it. And um, yeah, if there's anything um, case scenario specific that you want to go through, then again, pop me a mail and we can assess that as well. If there's no more questions, then it's been great to um, chat to you all today. I know it's um, quite a complex process and there's lots of different moving parts that need to be considered, um, but we're here to help. So I'm looking forward to hearing um, from you and I look forward to seeing you all and um, chatting through with you for the next webinar. Have a good rest of your day and take care.